This week, my guest is travel writer, explorer and environmentalist, Dervla Murphy. Do you know, I am really, really lucky. Getting to meet Dervla is no easy task at the best of times. But I was told that if I don't arrive today, her gate would be closed, locked with a padlock and the whole outside world would just have to wait for a couple of months to see her again. Interested in finding out why? Well, all will be revealed. So come on, join me as I make my way to the small but picturesque village of Lismore in County Waterford and to the converted pig house where Dervla lives. My parents, they were both blow-ins from, from Dublin and neither of them had ever lived in the country before when they married and came down to Lismore in February 1931. So it was quite an adventure for them. And I believe some of their relatives in Dublin were terribly worried because they thought before long, well, something awful would happen, like being killed by a cow. <laughs> I don't know whether that's true or not, but that's the story. <laughs> they met originally, I'm told, in in Poland, where, well, they were both on vacation there. And they were both travelling alone. So maybe this is where I get some of the solitary travelling from. (laughs) Tell me, why did they decide to leave Dublin and come down to the sticks, for want of a much better word? Oh, well, because that was the job my father got. He was county librarian for Waterford. So it was as simple as that. We did a lot of translating. Translating into what language or from what? From, From French. Where did he learn his French? Well, he was at the Sorbonne for seven years in, in Paris after he'd, immediately after he came out of prison. Do you want to contextualise as to why your, your dad was inside in a jail? <laughs> well, he was caught bearing a rifle, I think it was, or a weapon of some sort, in the back garden of their home in, in uh, Garvel Avenue, Rathgar, when he was 18 and he was imprisoned for three years. He was a member of the IRA yes. at the time. He and his father and his mo- well, his mother and sisters were in the common Amman. Yes, very strongly Republican. From your your mother's family, then, mm-hmm. right? What was their stance generally, and how did they respond to their daughter marrying this rebel? Um, no, that was that was bad um, from their point of view. Well, I mean, from both families' point of view. Well, I mean, this is civil war years we're thinking of, so they would have been just on the other side. And in the case of my mother's family, there were she had five brothers, and I think two of them were on the Republican side, and three on the other side. But I mean, there was it was, it was a real a civil war as you could get actually within the family. And when you were growing up, was there any particular relative that you were told, "God, you're the living spit of whoever," or you're you're a very, you're like, you've a streak in your like whoever? I don't think so, but I know who my favourite was. My paternal grandfather. I mean, I just adored him. He was a very big influence on my life, really. Though I was fourteen when he died, I suppose I just associated him with. You know, with lots of fun and and lots of books, and my mother was a very good pianist, I believe. But of course, she was an invalid, so I never heard her playing. When you say that your your mother was an invalid, I mean, was she an invalid from from a really early age? Mm, I never saw her standing or walking. She was always in a bath chair from the time I was six months. Rheumatoid arthritis. And I mean, there was ab- I don't think there's much to be done about it now, actually, but there was certainly nothing to be done about it then. Yes, I never thought there was anything until actually, yes, when I was at boarding school, I suppose about 13. Then I became self-conscious about it, you know, seeing other parents coming to visit Walking. their children. Yes. And I, so, and I can remember pretending mm. that... Um, you know, that my mother was just like everybody else's and making excuses for why she never came walking in. The 
first week I was desperately homesick and then after that I really enjoyed it and you know felt liberated because as an only child you know you're always being watched as your vest damp and <laughs> washed behind your ears and cut your toenails <laughs> so all the you know attention was taken off me as an individual I was just one pebble on the beach and it was a huge relief the only subjects that interested me were English and history and I had no intention of bothering my head with anything else um, I used to take myself off to the you know to the music one of the music rooms and you know right away for hours and hours and I think something now that couldn't happen in our time in any school um, the nuns actually realised that there was something going on here and you know they didn't bully me into attending all the classes I should have been attending I mean they saw that I was working in my own way so that's full marks to them and what kind of things were you writing even at that stage now? Oh, silly, you know, uh, adventure stories and, um, I mean, nothing even that I can remember, but reams of it. And, of course, as with everything, um, practice counts, you know. And um, So it wasn't a waste of time. It was, it was just, you know, my apprenticeship, really. But Dervla's apprenticeship was to come to an abrupt halt and so began a much more challenging and difficult part of her life. I'll let her explain. You see, I was only there for a few years. It was during the war time and we couldn't get anybody to help in the house. So in fact, I left at the age of 14. I was pleased at that stage, just as I was pleased to go there originally because, I mean, by then I'd realised that there was absolutely no possibility of my ever passing an exam because I just wasn't interested in exams. So that would have been a bit awkward with the parents, you know. <laughs> so there was a great escape clause <laughs> having to go home to look after your invalid mother suited me fine there. But later on it was very trying. I mean, I'm talking now about 14, you know, when I actually went home. And from then... Um, I would say for the next seven or eight years it was fine, you know. But by the time I was in my early 20s, um, I needed to be away from home as much as anybody else at that age. So it wasn't so easy then. I suppose I was about 25 when her health deteriorated very much and her kidneys became affected by having been immobile for so many years. And that leads to, I'm told, um, you know, a certain amount of, um, well, is it where poisons going to the brain if your kidneys aren't functioning properly. So she became extremely difficult to cope with then. But uh, that wasn't her real self, you know, and I mean, I realised that. She became, there was a real personality change, which was very hard to take at the time. And how did you cope with that, Dervla? Well, I, I don't know, you know, one just has to cope with what comes up in that way. My sense is that there's such a loss because even in front of your eyes, you're watching somebody that you love change mm. and there's a real sense of, of losing them, isn't there? That's right. And, you know, you put it very well because... In a sense, it's more of a sense of loss than when somebody dies, when the character changes, the personality. Mm. And, and was your dad still alive at that stage? He was, but he died 18 months before my mother. He got, he'd never been ill in his life. But then he got very bad flu one Christmas and asked to lead a delegation of librarians to the minister to talk about something I suppose to get more money for the libraries anyway he absolutely insisted on getting up and going off on the train to Dublin and um, got a relapse and a complication of the flu which oddly enough affected his kidneys so he died of nephritis six weeks later I mean you're the only daughter you're the only child yeah. and you're basically 
burying your dad mm -hmm. and then minding your mum who was deteriorated. How bad did things get? Well, things got very, very bad after my father's death. And for a whole year, I simply wasn't able to leave the house. She needed constant attention. And she'd got to the point where she wouldn't really accept care from anybody except me. And the nights were always disturbed. I never got a full night's sleep. And at that point, when I was writing my autobiography, I realised that there was a whole blank year. I couldn't remember any of the details. I only know that I was living on whiskey and cigarettes. I suppose I must have eaten something, but I don't know what, not very often. So I was just... Um, well, drugging myself to to get through with it. And depending on three very good friends, well, four actually, but one lived elsewhere, three living locally who were a huge support and who made me realise how tremendously important it is to have such friends that you can rely on even when they disapprove of your lifestyle that they'll still rally around and support you so that's the state I was in um, really not not registering anything much except you know that I felt completely trapped and miserable and the you know, the whiskey and the and the cigarettes were keeping me going. I was elated when she died because, I mean, she had had no quality of life for quite a few years before that. And um, I just rejoiced that she was dead and didn't feel any guilt about that rejoicing. Now, needless to say, her mother's passing was a significant turning point in Dervla's life. No longer responsible for another, she began her quest to travel afar and relish in her newfound solitude. Oh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. <laughs> I wanted to travel and to write books and I was perfectly clear about that in my mind. Just wanting to see unfamiliar places and meet with unfamiliar people and see how different just how different people lived well, who knows where it came from I mean probably um, to some extent from my mother though she never had the obviously as an invalid the opportunity mm -hmm. to travel far but I think she would have liked to and um, I think she you know, she enjoyed travelling vicariously through me because she was the first person to suggest that I should go off on my bike around Europe when I was uh, I was about 16. I mean, there weren't too many mothers in Ireland at that day, stage who were actually encouraging their daughters to <laughs> take off alone on a bicycle with a sleeping bag. <laughs> But, I mean, she had very strong opinions, you know, and, and she was um, she was very well able to argue her points, you know. Well, I suppose what was so special was that until her health deteriorated, um, you know, she was so incredibly courageous. I mean, you never heard her complaining about the fact that she was completely crippled. I mean, she couldn't even move her fingers, you know. I mean, rheumatoid arthritis just takes you over completely and every every joint in her body was locked apart from her you know her neck and head but she never complained then as soon as my mother died um, that was in August 62 well that was the end of the not of the cigarette I went on smoking but it was the end of the dependence on whiskey and I just concentrated then on my 
cycle to India, which started a few months later and on preparing for that. And then just, you know, went on knowing that she would have been happy to see me doing what I was able to do afterwards. I mean, both my parents, too, would have been... That just makes me rather sad that they weren't alive when my first book was published because they really would have rejoiced. Two thousand and two, Russia, um, doing a trip on a train, and not only do you damage your your calf muscle, but then you kind of wreck your knee, and then you do more damage. And but what does she do? She keeps going. Who does that remind you of? <laughs> yeah, you've got a point there. Yes. One of the thoughts that was coming to me. And I don't mean this in any disrespect. When I was coming down the car, I, says, I would love to see this woman's calves, you know, as in like your, you know, below your knee, because I'm thinking they must be phenomenal. <laughs> They're pretty strong, yes. Look, I'm now looking at them, shall we? Oh, and there's oh my god they're solid as rocks I'm actually feeling them <laughs> you're absolutely right oh wow <laughs> but but in some ways those calves have served you well very well indeed mm-hmm. your your big trip I know you're probably blue in the face from talking about your big trip the bicycle trip that was what was it 4,200 miles and took you six months six months with the day tour in Afghanistan another one in um, up to Gilgit I mean I didn't go straight through and I'm not going to talk about that because I mean that's you, it's been told over and over again I think there's other mm. stories that I suppose that that was one of the first books that I ever read belonged to you and I've read it a long long time ago mm. the one that I'm most interested in at the moment I that I only finished last summer was your book on Ethiopia mm. that was one of my best journeys you know it was a wonderful journey and, but again I wouldn't want to go back to Ethiopia as it is now it's so sad to look over, you know, all the 50 years I've been travelling and think how many of the countries I enjoyed so much have been destroyed, mainly by war or famine in in that time. There was a few things that came to me because I was, I was planning at that stage even to, to talk to you. I said, I have to interview this lady. Mm-hmm. I had a real sense that you were utterly mad going over these mountains that are like amazingly high right mm-hmm. and you were and you got lost a few times where I, I was actually sensing the despair by reading the book <laughs> I mean I'd, I'd actually forgotten that until you recall it now you know it's it's such a long time ago <laughs> it's extraordinary you know when I meet people or get letters and I realise somebody's focusing in you know on a bit of my life so long ago that I've completely forgotten <laughs> well, isn't that the one wonderful thing about books? It's like that's that's this the archival history of of what makes up Irish people, and you're one of those people. And and even though you've forgotten in some ways, because it's been documented, it's there forever. Well, I suppose that's true, but uh, that reminds me of a very interesting debate that we had at just this January um, at the Key West travel writing seminar and somebody in the audience you know the the audience were asking questions and somebody asked us the the panel sitting up on the platform what we thought about accuracy in travel writing and how important it was and it was very interesting that the younger generation of travel writers there didn't really attach too much importance to accuracy and us oldies Peter Matheson was there and Barry Lopez and myself all of us you know around 70 or over and we all felt strongly that it was of the first importance to be absolutely accurate writing a travel book and I think it was Barry who who made the point of no it wasn't it was Peter Matheson that um, in fact you know when you describe your journeys in detail like say his in Nepal or mine in um, in Ethiopia that we are recorded the countries a 
as they were at that time and never will be again and therefore future sociologists, historians, even geographers will be looking back and relying on our reports even if we think they're fairly light-hearted and trivial at the time and therefore for us to invent things you know or distort anything leave something out put something in is quite wrong You said you also described uh, particularly in the Ethiopian book about some of the men and you described them they sound really wonderful bodies and wonderful looking men all together and I often wonder I said to myself God I wonder does she ever have any liaisons at all with anybody when she's around (laughs) the answer to that is no (laughs) surely it's about there's somebody that you know that you meet and that you get into this kind of very sort of intimate conversations and and does it never kind of progress at all never no (laughs) loneliness is that something that Presumably it has featured when you're out there in isolation. Um, Yes, surrounded by splendour, but surely there's times when you just really, really want to basically have somebody beside you to hug you. No, I don't know what it feels like. (laughs) Truly, yes. No, I can't be too much alone. I just love solitude. I know in the early years you, you had a weapon that you held on to for a short time on your first journey, isn't That's it? That's right. And then I sold it in Afghanistan. Yeah. It had served its purpose. That's right. I decided after that a knife would actually be safe. So I've always carried a knife since then. But I think there are many countries where you're actually safer travelling as a woman on your own than as a man. Particularly the, you know, the Muslim countries I've been in, Iran... Afghanistan, Pakistan, you know, the code of honour when it comes to women and who are accepted into the village, the home as a guest, is so strong that um, I would think you're a good deal safer than in, in many countries in Europe nowadays. People often ask me, what do you do for your holidays? And in fact, my holiday is when I've finished a book, opening the gates here and having friends to stay. That's my holiday. And I really enjoy that. You know, people I may not have seen for a few years. Do you know what? It's interesting when you say, when I finish my book, I open up the gates. Does that mean that when you're writing, the gates stay shut? They stay padlocked, very much so. Mm. That That's a pure discipline. It is. <laughs> but very necessary for me. I mean, there are some people who, you know, they can write their books quite happily with regular or irregular interruptions and normal sort of social life but I actually can't do that I I have to just focus on one thing at a time Somebody wrote that there had been a change for you. Now, I'm just trying to say, 1981, they say, was your turning point in terms of your book writing. I'm not sure, would you concur with that and would you explain to me what that turning point was? Now, I think Three Mile Island, when we were on the way back from Peru and we just happened to be passing as it was threatening to melt down, though, of course, happily it never did. This was a nuclear power station? Yes, in in. Pennsylvania and spent a week or so in Boston with a group of anti-nuclear people and and they persuaded me to do a book against the nuclear power industry before I did the Peru book so I gave in even though I knew you know as much as cat here in my lap knows about nuclear power at that stage but I I always boast that when it did come out the even though you know some of the um, kingpins of the nuclear power industry in Britain were absolutely furious and I can't remember the one he was head of something what was he head of then I mean he really attacked me but he couldn't actually find any mistakes in the book 
so that gave me huge satisfaction <laughs> what concerns me most let's say by now is the real threat of climate change which obviously isn't going to affect me or even you very much I should think but will undoubtedly uh, affect grandchildren and great grandchildren and the whole planet and I suppose I feel that we're not sufficiently aware of personal responsibility when it comes to this it seems such a vast global thing and we're inclined to think well I as one individual can do absolutely nothing about it Mm -hmm. whereas if every individual on the planet did a little bit about it it would make some difference you know if I could have a, a magic wand and wave it I'd wish that that every individual would think more in every way about not only climate change but the environment generally What's next for Dervler Murphy? Oh, I never think beyond the next book. <laughs> and anyway, at 74, you know, it doesn't do to look too far ahead because I'm four years into overtime if you take the Bible seriously, which of course I don't. But <laughs> so well into overtime. This series is kindly made with the support of Sound and Vision, which is a broadcasting funding scheme initiated by the Broadcasting Commission of Ireland.